side, Team 1 on the red. And already that Olaf, that power pick, being removed by Fenerbahce alongside the Cogmore and the Alistair. During the regular season, Forlan was 8 and 1 on that Olaf pick. And in the tiebreaker versus the Dire Wolves, it was a big part of why they were able to get that win. So 1907 Fenerbahce is saying, you know what? We're just going to take it off the board. Meanwhile, Team 1, they're actually attacking one of the weakest early game performers on the side of 1907 Fenerbahce in Padden, already taking two AD carries away uh, from the Turkish squad. And it looks like that Sive could very well be left. Those are the only three AD carries that he's actually played. But you may expect something like a Callista, given that they are on the red side. We have to see what Team 1 decides to do finally. It is the Galio from Fenerbahce. But Padden has been a performer who struggles in lane, but when it gets to the late game, absolutely shreds through his opposite numbers. He has been the standout performer for Fenerbahce when it comes to team fights later on. Callista left open here because of the Rakan ban from Team 1. Ooh, and it looks like 1907 Fenerbahce are going to say, you know what, we will just pick that one up and we're more than happy to take it. But remember, Callista is very much about dominating the laning phase. She is an early to mid game style of AD carry. Thanks to her ultimate, she's great at setting up these engages and you have so many options to kind of force things in the mid game. But that's not what we've been seeing recently from this Fenerbahce squad. They've been more about the mid to late game team fight. So I feel like Team 1 are challenging Fenerbahce here. And they're going to see, let's see how well you can hold up in our 2v2. And it's something Team 1 do so well. They capitalize on their enemy's mistakes. So they're saying, here, we'll put you in a lane perhaps you're not as comfortable with and make you make those mistakes. They'll get the Sejuani for Forlan, a jungler that can work out early alongside the Lulu for Redbird. But bear in mind, the, the Jarvan has also been left available. I know that Thaldrin is more than happy to play this champion. He's always a big part of allowing the team to succeed. He really is a core strength or structure that allows the team or supports the team, allowing them to succeed in a lot of these later game fights. So I think Fenerbahce right now, they're going to look to get themselves the comfort jungle pick for Crash. He's had a lot of great jungle steals or Baron steals rather on that Gragas. And I wouldn't be surprised now if they rounded things out with something like a Gragas or maybe even a Thresh, which is very, uh, a very good pick into the Lulu. Very good at catching the Lulu out. Fenerbahce will go for the Morgana instead, though, trying to get rid of some of that CC chain. We have seen a few teams bringing out. Fnatic, especially yesterday, were very good at catching people out with that crowd control. Team 1 now have the choice to go towards an AD carry or perhaps lock in a mid laner and then look for bans in that second phase. I wonder, I wonder, because I'm very surprised right now that Jarvan has been left up for so long during the draft, but Team 1 are saying, you know what, we want to try and get a comfort pick for our mid laner. Brusa, he did not have the best performance in this tournament so far. Uh, he felt pretty far behind when going up against Jensen especially. And uh, now that he will be able to get that Syndra, very big power pick for him in the mid, a lot of setup as well uh, in terms of the early game. But he is playing against a mid laner that has had a lot of focus on him, both through the regular split and through this play-in tournament. Frozen has been one of the key catalysts for Fenerbahce, especially with Crash being his old teammate, trying to synergize alongside him. So now it looks like that Team 1 are just trying to take away some of the possible answers for Brusa. And uh, 1907 Fenerbahce are going to do the opposite, saying like, oh, okay, we know what's pretty good into Callista. We're going to ban away some of these AD carries. And a part of me feels like Team 1 have something special planned. I don't know what it is, Medic, but I just, based on the way the draft is going, I feel like they need to bring something special up because Callista is not the kind of champion you can let through. We saw what happens when you give it to a team like Cloud9 yesterday, and they very swiftly run away with the game. So given the strength of the champion in the current meta, you have to have something prepared. Might save it for the last pick. We might see it here. No top laners picked for either side. Zaya snuck all the way through as well, so she will be locked in for Team 1 has been one of the priority AD carries across the course of the split. But in terms of the 2v2, I don't think it's going to do a lot to be able to shut down this Callista. When you look at things right now, 1907 Fenerbahce definitely should have the advantage in terms of the matchup. But as we know, Padden is not known for his laning phase. He is not about dominating that two versus two. So it's certainly going to be an exciting lane matchup to watch as Fenerbahce round out with their final two picks. Getting the Maokai for Thordrin is just a, a great pick for Fenerbahce in general. He's played incredibly well on it, ganks that mid lane incredibly effectively, and now they've got their mid lane pick to finalize into the Syndra. Already LeBlanc and Oriana have been removed. We have seen Echoes picked into it before, but it's going to be the Talia for Fenerbahce. So he's going more for the roaming style to the uh, very good at pretty much holding her own in any matchup, really. Uh, she doesn't really lose matchups, but at the same vein, she doesn't win them either. 
but what you do really want on Talia is pressure because once you have pressure it gives you the freedom to roam once you get that level six you have the ultimate which makes it very easy to go from one lane to the other cut off the escape routes of your opposition as well and I think that's what Fenerbahce is going to be looking for right now with the Kalista and the Talia early game playmaking on these side lanes especially towards the bottom side of the map seems very optimal but with team one esports rounding things out with the Shen it's going to make it harder for Fenerbahce to try and force plays down in the bottom lane because once he hits level 6, that Shen is primed and ready to turn those ganks in their favor. Both these teams have had pretty dominant performances in their own regions. Fenerbahce winning the last split in Turkey with outstanding fashion, in all honesty. Team 1 doing the same in Brazil, upsetting a lot of fans who are supporting INTZ or Pain or even Red Canids, and they are the new upstart team from Brazil that are now challenging on the world stage, but neither of these teams have really shone too greatly in the playing stage. Fenerbahce struggled at times against HKA, Team 1 struggled against Cloud9, and now is their opportunity to prove that they de deserve to be amongst the last 16 at Worlds. I think both teams are happy with who they drew. From Team 1 Esports side, they're like, oh, we didn't get one from the big three regions. Uh, and from Fenerbahce's aspect, they're looking at it from like, oh, okay, we actually got an opponent from one of the weakest performing groups. I think uh, it's going to result in a really exciting matchup because both teams are confident. Both teams have drafted very strong compositions. And it's all going to be about this early game from the side of Fenerbahce. How well can they utilize this Kalista? Can they finally build themselves an advantage in the 2v2? Or will Fallan be the catalyst that allows Team 1 to get the early lead and win out against Fenerbahce? Single best of five remains between one of these teams and a spot in the group stage at Worlds. And I'm interested to hear you say that Fenerbahce are going to look for this early game because that has not been a characteristic of their play-ins thus far. They've been much more about having a minor deficit coming up later on into the game and then being able to out-team fight their opponents. That's typically what we've seen, especially when you look at the tiebreaker between Fenerbahce and HKA. In the early game, HKA were dominant. They were destroying the two versus two down in the bottom lane. They had pressure in the mid. Everything was looking wonderful, but then they were not making the correct decisions in the mid game and Fenerbahce were very quick to immediately punish them. Multiple times we saw them getting picks here and there, pushing their vision line even deeper and then starting to group up as a five-man unit where this team truly shines. Pan's positioning and teamfight execution is fantastic and that's largely because of the amount of input that Thaldrin puts in for his team. He really is a pillar that allows players like Pan and like Frozen to shine at the top and allow them to really stand out. But it's thanks to that backbone that he provides on these big tanks. So I'm excited to see this slight pivot from the side of Fenerbahce and how Team 1 will be able to respond because they do feel like they, they're pretty confident. They're saying, we don't think you can get an early game 2v2 lead. So we're gonna pick something that scales better, especially with the Lulu, and we're gonna bring it in team fights a little bit later on. And that hasn't always been characteristic of Team 1. Thaldrin and Frozen are going to step forward here. They'll spot that these Razor Beaks are not being done and steal away a few of them for their own. Puts Fallan a little bit behind in this jungle, so he needs to be cautious with his pathing and react to the aggression put on by Fenerbahce early on. I don't think he's going to be too upset about this because by starting on the red, you typically want to go to walls and then down towards the blue. You can see from Team 1 Esports, they did put that ward in the river to anticipate a potential invade from the side of Fenerbahce. But no invade coming out. Instead, it happened on the top side, and that will allow Crash to get his early level 2, along with getting his own Raptors and red. And now he's going to pass towards the top. But already in this 2v2 lane, you can see... Padden and Japone being forced back. And this was a little bit what we were talking about. This is why I had a little a few question marks around this Morgana because champions like the Thresh often have a lot more power when it comes to utilizing the strengths of Callista in the early game. Alongside that, Japone has the Ignite in the lane, so they're expecting to be able to win out this laning phase. Padden pushes forward a little bit as Red, but trades back onto him with the Glitter Lance. And this is something that Team 1 do well in that bottom lane. Absolute and Red, but a great synergy between the two. But meanwhile, Crash is coming up towards top. Vert will get himself away from Thaldrin. And Crash, as a jungler, obviously only substituted in to Fenerbahce just before World started. He used to play with Frozen on Longzu, so there's a little bit of synergy there. But when he plays this Gragas, we tend to see him just slowly farm up and sometimes look towards mid for those early ganks. Yeah, the thing about Crash is what we heard a lot about 
from many analysts and experts was that this guy loves to get in your face early. He's all about trying to snowball the lanes. Um, but coming onto a new team in a different environment, you've got to kind of adapt. You've got to shift and pivot your playstyle. And I think that he's done a fine job for now. But while his early gank failed, Fallout's looking to do find some success in the top lane. The entry fragger looking for his first kill as Vert there as well. The flash away, but Thorjan's gonna get stunned and this will be first blood for team one in the top lane. Fallout with a good movement up to the top side. He had the Raptor stolen away from him, but remember, he went from red into wolves, into blue, then up to Raptor, which means he was on the top side. Top was already pushing in the favor of Baldrin, and now Vert is off to a great start. Fallen staying around here, Vert backs off a little bit, Thorjan will spot him out, there's the taunt, and once again, Fallen's just looking for the setup, crashes on the top side, he'll be looking to try and get towards his top lane to save him, but the stun comes out once again, crash with the belly bop, knocks him back, Thorjan down to half, as Vert puts down the spirit's refuge, Bernard Bache able to fight this one out, as Crash came to the rescue for his top lane, and meanwhile in the bottom lane, a root lands onto Absolute, and he has to use the heal and the barrier, the ignite ticking, Padam with the final shot, gets the spear in the back, and now Redbird's trying to turn it around, he does get the help picks, and will trade one for one in the bottom lane. Wow, action happening all across the board, but this time, 1907 Fenerbahce able to answer the pressure being put out from Team 1. Forlan trying to get those early kills for his team. He knows how important it is for them to have that early advantage, especially against the Callista, and he's investing it into the split pusher in Vert. This is the first kill that happened down onto Thaldrin. Successful gank. They get that early first blood onto the top lane split pusher that has given them a lot of success in the past. And while all this was happening, an engage happens down bot. Absolute getting a little bit too aggressive there, sitting in the mini wave for a very long time and really get soaking up way too much damage than he should have. Unfortunately for Patton, this early game Lulu damage is surprisingly high. So he ends up giving away his life as well. But the fact that they're able to get a kill just goes to show that Patton, he's not messing around this game. He is very much about trying to answer the uh or try to utilize the early pressure that he has on this callista having the ignite in lane definitely helped them out as well as redbutt's heal was not as effective as it could be we see padden go back and secure himself a recurve bow will definitely help him out in the lane a little bit lots of focus towards mid here though from team one as they bring redbutt and forlan across crash is towards the bottom side of the map perhaps eyeing up a gank on absolute he talks a lot about the AD carry and how Padden, during the laning phase, he really is rather weak, minus 21.8 CSD. Um, and this is the thing about Padden, he is very much a double-edged sword where during the laning phase, he's kind of like a wooden stick. He kind of hits you and it doesn't do much damage. But when it comes into team fights, he's kind of like Excalibur. There is no sword that matches its, its team fight prowess. And uh, this is where he's really allowed to shine. We've talked a lot about how he has shifted this style and already he's doing great, but Pan, he's so far during the laning phase off to a fantastic start. It is the lanes we expected them to win as well. So I have to see how they're able to translate that first kill into more in this bottom lane, because that's something Fenerbahce haven't always been the best at, actually accelerating when they have that early gold lead. And in fact, here, Team 1 with that extra kill are still sitting about 400 gold ahead. And while this is a great shift for the side of Fenerbahce in terms of their play style, have a look at Brusa trying to make a play up towards the top side. A lot of investment from Team 1 Esports to trying to snowball the he is playing Shen, and one of the most successful champions I saw from Team 1 during their regular season, especially during their playoffs, was when Vert got his hands on Shen. This is a team that knows extremely well how to utilize side lane pressure. They know how to play the 1-3-1, one one, the 4-1 style of play. And it looks like Fenerbahce are trying to shut that down. Thornton's going to go in the knockback onto Vert as well. No flash for him and no way of escaping Crash and Thordren who will be able to secure the kill. 2-2, two two. Fenerbahce and 1 are even in the early game. So many ganks happening onto both these tanks. Not typically where you expect all the early jungle pressure to go, but so far it is keeping the game very even. It, identical scorelines for both these top laners. And this could hurt Vert later on, as he will try to set up the 1-4 style of play that 1 are looking to take advantage of. But Fenerbahce, as we've said, great team fighting team. It's going to be fascinating to see how both these teams force the style that they are so comfortable at using. And alongside that, you have to think of the the pressure on the players themselves. Momentum in a best of five is incredibly important, Edius. And being able to get the first win on the board, being able to say, yep, we, you know, we're able to actually shut this team down when playing a composition we're comfortable with, sets you up for success so well as you come later on into the series. 
just looking at the state of the map right now, because while Team 1 do have a slight lead, things like the Infernal Drake are on the board. And right now, neither team putting a huge amount of emphasis on trying to get it super early. You can see a bit of vision coming out from Brusa in the bottom half of the river. And there are pings now coming down, so we were just talking about low focus, and Fenerbahce see this as an opportunity to make something end. Throws in on a ward, does know that Brusa's around there because of the ward that Brusa has just stepped across, and Brusa is actually relatively even in this lane. There hasn't been too much focus from the jungle as mid, but Brusa really struggled playing up against Jensen when they had to play them in groups, and this is a, a much stronger showing from him early on. It does help when the jungler doesn't come mid like three to four times in the space of five minutes, but that is what comes with playing against a player like Jensen, and Frozen, he's pretty much just been holding his own alongside Brusa on this Cinder. We haven't seen a huge amount of early game plays being centered around the mid, but I'm sure Brusa has no issue with that. A lot of vision now being vested from 1907 Fenerbahce in the bottom side of one's jungle. Team 1, they have no idea where he is. It looks like he's trying to steal away this blue buff. Misses the body slam, the knockback will come out. There is the unleashed power straight onto the base of Crash, and he will get removed from the map by Team 1. Good utilization of the Shen ultimate there. Just as Crash tries to get a punish onto Brusa, they're able to instantly turn it around, demonstrating some familiarity with this Shen pick, instantly coming in, ready to save his mid laner and turn the fight in their face. And it's the strength that we said Team 1 have. They capitalize on their enemy's mistakes. When they see someone out of position, they make the play, and now they're making the play for the Inferno. They secure it, but Patton is not done. The TPs are gonna join this fight, and they look for the root. Doldrin goes in onto Red, but he's used the word growth, but he will be the first to fall. Team 1 just looking to run away. They're accepting a kill and a blue buff in exchange for the Inferno. So this time round, Vert didn't have the Shen ultimate to save his teammate's life. So Thaldrin, he wanted to take advantage of the TP. Now they couldn't get the Infernal Drake, but they are able to get one kill. It did cost them a teleport, but Vert also used his teleport to try and match it. This is where the play all kicked off. And really, you have to criticize Crash for trying to make this play. He's not showing full respect towards the Shen ultimate. He thinks that he has enough damage with the element of surprise aspect that he and Frozen were ready, trying to get the collapse down, and they end up losing their life instead. So arguably a bit of a misplay, a bit of over-eagerness on the side of Crash. Coming back down to that bottom lane where we saw Padden have the advantage early on. He's got the kill in that last fight. He's now 20 CS up as well. And we want to start to see this translate into tower damage, into pressure on the rest of the map, because you have to use this Callista while she spikes. Otherwise, as you get later on in the game, you will get outmatched by something like Isaiah. But I think that just for Padden as a whole, this is great in terms of confidence and also just for the team, because we know the 1907 Fenerbahce are a great team fighting team. We know that they've been able to come from a deficit thanks to their ability to work as a five-man unit. And Team One Esports threw out the challenge to Padden and said, we don't think you can build an early game lead through your bottom lane. And they were the ones that ended up giving that early lead over thanks to a failed two versus two. So Padden, off to a great start. Likely going to transition this well, but it now matters about how well they can deal with the split pushing Shen being played by Vert, because this is the style that Vert likes to use, as it looks like Fenerbahce trying to set up a bit of a dive in the middle lane. And this is what Thordrin likes to do, he likes to do. He is the pillar of the team, and he likes to get these ganks off. Flash straight into Crash. Brusa knocked back the seismic shove. Will spell his end. Fenerbahce get the kill. Now Forland's going to try and protect his tower a little bit as he forces Thordrin back. It's that magic healing up, and Fenerbahce will be able to get, get the kill in the dive. And this is why we call this man a pillar. He is the foundation of this team that sets up his carries for success. We saw this in the group stages against teams like HK and Rampage, where he would roam from the top lane and try and get his mid laner killed using the Maokai, using the ultimate, and he's found success in the mid lane once again. And it's the timing with which he does it as well. He is the captain of the team, and he knows when those Stand Uniteds are up, and when those Teleports are up, and when people can actually join that fight. It was superbly done by Fenerbahce. They also secure first tower for the first time in the tournament, and they get a gold lead of about 2,000 here over Team 1. So what we're basically saying is the, the Turkish representatives looking rather strong in their first game of this best of five series. Team 1 tried to challenge them, and Fenerbahce are certainly answering the challenge. But now it's very much about how they transition it. Let's have a look back at how this play came about. Thaldrin, he just walked down. There was no vision on the side of Team 1. You can see on your minimap, no wards on the top half of the map. 
it gave him the freedom to just walk straight through the jungle, set up the flank. The ultimate was used to force the flash out of Brutza, but then Crash was there to cut off his escape. Beautiful mid lane dive that will also set them up nicely to work towards that mid lane tower after they've gotten their hands on that juicy tier one up top. Padden and Japone being rotated up towards the top side to try and shut down Vert in this split push. In fact, they're going in with the base cool into the Soul Shackles. Vert flashes away, respect, but gets caught in the binding, puts down the Spirit's Refuge. Padden will still get the stacks from this, though, as he looks to dive the Shen underneath the tower. And 13 minutes in, Padden is already 3 and 1. You have to question the decision making there from Vert. The top laner goes missing for a long time. You've already lost your bottom tier 1. This swap should be expected. But instead, he overstays in the top lane. He also eats the binding from Japone. And now they're looking to lose this tier one. Fortunately, team one will get there just in time to defend it. But this bottom lane of 1907 Fenerbahce are really stepping up in this first game. It's exactly what we wanted to see from them. And Frozen is looking up towards the top side for a little bit more. Stand United is available for Bert as he comes up. Not even going to channel it yet as one. Are going to get dived underneath this tower. There we go. Absolute. Pops the barrier. Wild God used as well. The dive continues. Benabache trying to get what they can out of this fight. They take the tower first. The stun is going to land onto Absolute. Fall and dead. It's a double for Frozen. And one are just getting scattered to the winds. A great binding from Japone. Three kills down. Red button running away. But I'm not sure he's going to escape today. It's Benabache collapsed from all four sides and they play the early game well. They don't even need to get to the late game. They don't even need to get to team fights because Benabache are routing team one. Beautiful dive once again. Thordren looking to round out the fight with another kill onto Redbird. Everything going fantastically for the Turkish representatives. This is fantastic in terms of their early game. We wondered how they would use the early advantages built both up in the bottom lane and in the mid lane thanks to the roams from Thordren. And you can see the difference that Pan has made compared to his average throughout the tournament. And when you give an AD carry that's immense in team fights that sort of early lead, you can only suspect that he will be devastating as this game goes later on. So. The thing about this play you have to realize is that Fenerbahce is so much faster on the play. We needed to see that Shen ultimate now. Keep your eyes on the minimap too, where the Syndra is. She is one of the big pieces of damage that is not in this fight yet. So by the time she finally joins, yes, she lands a stun onto the Callista, but Pan's damage has already been done. Aldrin, he's dishing out his fair amount of damage as well. And Team 1, they're just too divided, they're too spread out. They're not ready for this kind of collapse. And this was one of the biggest weaknesses we identified about them from their playoff run was that, yes, they're really good at using side lane pressure. They're really good when the enemy team is split up. But when their opposition just group up as a five and come at them, especially only 15 minutes into the game, they kind of crumble. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to react. And 1907 Fenerbahce are saying, well, okay, we'll just group up as often as possible and we'll force you into this situation and we'll, we'll get the win every time. As you say, that is 16 minutes in, they now have a 5,000 gold lead. It's the sort of lead we saw from C9 and from Fnatic and from Team WE in their dominant games. And they don't look like they are stopping at all. They've had so many great rotations. Frozen using that Weaver's Wall incredibly effectively to join fights when he needed to. And once again, he's going towards mid. It's Thaldrin and Frozen. It's the dynamic duo trying to catch out Brusa. Thaldrin will be able to lock him up with the cat and he will get the kill. The pillar on which Fenerbahce stands once again helps Frozen in the mid lane. Setting up for his team for success. Thaldrin finding so many fantastic picks for Fenerbahce. Working with Frozen to shut down an overextended Brusa once more. I was about to bring up the topic of how do we find ways of Team 1 coming back into this game. And one of them was they need to be the ones to find picks. They need to be the ones to punish the slight overstep from Fenerbahce. But they can't afford to make those kind of mistakes themselves. They cannot afford to be the ones overstepping. And unfortunately for them, Fenerbahce is now in an extremely dominant position. They're going to utilize this repel to better break into the set of tier two towers. And now what I want to see from them is the movement of their vision line up towards the top half, or maybe even the bottom half of Team One Esports jungle. They're, the world is their oyster at this point. 
Ball and looking to make that pick you wanted. Vert there as well, but there's not much more damage. Explosive cast comes out. Borland still trying to sweep away Frozen, but the Sejuani can't freeze the Talia in place. Busa eventually joins the fight, but won't be able to get any Scatter the Weeks down. And Fenerbahce are just starting to push forward into the jungle of Team 1. You have to question the decision making here from Team 1, though. Why is the AD carry and support in the bottom lane when you have a Shen? They try to interrupt Crash and his spawning, but the Black Shield prevents the interrupt. They're able to get the Rift Hound out. He's still going to be at full health, too. Fenerbahce, they are not taking their foot off the gas pedal. And one of the major worries we had for Fenerbahce coming into this series was the synergy they had with Crash, because he is a new player. But you can see just from that play there that Japon and Crash, oh, no, Crash and the rest of Fenerbahce are on the same page. Oh, he's fine. He's, fine. he's not going to go for it. Yeah, he's okay. They're going to go for the mid lane tower instead. Flank from Baldrin. This is something we see him do so often. Get that nature's grass off, look for the catch, perhaps onto Brutza or onto Absolute, but good play from Team 1 to block the hats that were coming in to try and secure a lockdown. Also, a bit a bit too early from Baldrin. He saw Minion Wave already there, but then it instantly gets cleared out from Brutza, so the ultimate was used to zone away Team 1 from the tower. But unfortunately, uh, Fenerbahce didn't have the Minion Wave to then commit to that objective once they were zoned off. Now they have a uh, Siege Minion and plenty of damage down onto this tower. It should be an easy pick up for them. 5-0 to zero in their favor right now. 1907, Fenerbahce looking fantastic in this first game. Have to remember that Team 1 are a very young team as well. No player on this team above 20 years of age, and sometimes it just takes you a little bit of time to acclimatize to the stage you're on. Especially when you're playing a lane that you, you need to try and go even, or that you're calling your opponent out and saying, we don't think you can play as well as you proposition to do in draft. When that goes against you, it can definitely play on your mind. So I want to see just a bit of patience here from Team 1. They do have scaling on their side with the Zaya, with the Lulu. They can play late game. The question is whether they can hold back the hordes of 1907 Fenerbahce for long enough. Exactly that. And uh, Team 1, you have to remember this is still a best of five series. There's still plenty of opportunities to turn things around later on. But with the game not over just yet, after we did see a 60-minute slugfest between Lion and C9 yesterday, you never know. Uh, if teams are able to hold the line. It's very much about how Fenerbahce find ways to break into the base. And now, this is very early into the game, but Fenerbahce, they're going to start thinking about this Baron objective, not necessarily to take it, but to try and find picks onto their opposition. Push Vision deep into the enemy half of the jungle to look for flanks like this one. Thordrum with the TP. I don't think Absolute has realized this has happened yet. As the shield comes out, Redbird there as well. Forland looking for the flank. They'll knock Thordrum back, but already Absolute's taking the chunk. Redbird there as well. Here come the rest of Fenerbahce. Grusa off towards the side, trying to knock them back. The seismic shove does not connect. And F. Fenerbahce are just going to continue to roll this forward. However, they are flanked. They get some damage onto Bert, who flashes away. The explosive cast helps them secure the kill. And now the Featherstorm has to come out from Absolute. He flashes. Bruce is still off towards the back side. Great. Glacial Prism onto Frozen, but he will cleanse that away. He is at one with the ice. And now Fenerbahce are looking to go towards that Baron. Now the jungler is still alive for Team 1. Fenerbahce could only find a single kill onto the, and he still has teleport available. Fenerbahce, they don't want to commit to the Baron, though. They're still eyeing up those picks. Not quite a Weaver's Wall that locks in Team 1. Forland's going to jump across the wall and bring Thorgrim with him, and now he's caught in the wrong place as Redbird comes across to try and help his jungler. If they can take down Forland, Benavache can look for that Baron, but they're going for Redbird instead. Absolute pulled off towards the side as Thorgrim is that tank, is that shield that Benavache need when the going gets tough and when they're looking to close out games. This is much more of what they wanted, Frozen. The ultimate initially does not look good, but then Team 1 stick around too long. They do not want to give up all this pressure around the Baron, but because they overstay, 1907 Benavache go for the punish, and now they've got their eyes on this Baron. With the Callista, with the Gragas, they have everything they could need to shut down that objective. 22 minutes in, they have an 11,000 gold lead. It's just ticked over, it's 10,000 gold, still 22 minutes, five towers to none, 13 kills to four, a Baron in their back pocket, and a five and one Padden coming out from laning phase. Yeah, That's what good. I want to see. It's pretty good. It's pretty good if you are a Turkish fan. If you're a Brazilian fan, on the other hand, I'm sure you'll be thinking about how you adapt. You always have Marth on that substitute bench. If you need to bring him in, he has been perhaps slightly more consistent than Prusa across the course of this tournament. But it also comes back to one of the... Uh, oh, yeah, we're going to have a quick look at that Weaver's War from Frozen. We have... Uh, 
They wanted to let the Baron go, but they just couldn't quite do it. You can see Thordren, he's able to land the W down onto Forlan. The rest of the team goes to the Collapse Red, but unfortunately, you can't really provide big enough shields to shut down four members, which means that multiple members end up dropping, and now Forlan looking for a pick. And they jump straight onto both, and the shield comes out, but it might be too little too late. Does manage to flash to safety. Rusa had to flash for that as well, though, so it ends up being a summoner for summoner exchange. But Tanabachi, they still have the Baron. They've got their eyes on the bottom lane. But he's going to struggle to hold Thaldron up in the top lane. Now they take the objective down, and Tanabachi, this is great from them. You know, they, their individual lane is stepping up. Thaldron continuing to be that that true core of the team, really, once again, setting up a lot of the map for success, either being it in terms of engages or setting up Frozen for success in the middle lane, along with Pattern just stepping up individually. That 2v2 really holding its own, getting their own advantages. And because all of this came together, the already good strengths from Fenerbahce combined with the new strengths we're now seeing from Fenerbahce and Chabon, this team is looking very con convincing in this first game. Do you still have to close it out? Fenerbahce have the longest game time of any team in players, and sometimes it's because they can't quite close out when they do have a lead. You see Padden forced back there. They're trying to play up towards the top side as Thordren continues to push in, but Vert does have the teleport advantage and the stand united if a fight was to erupt. You've also got to respect the Team 1 composition as well. While they are certainly behind, there is a lot of instant burst and pick potential from the side of things like Syndra, from the Sejuani, from the Taunt of the Shen. A lot of things you just have to show care towards because when you have such a convincing lead, you don't want to make one of those silly mistakes and potentially throw it away. As now, Fordren, you'd think he'd be in danger, but he's in his natural habitat. He is a tree of the jungle, of course. King of the jungle at the moment as well. No one really can step up to him. Fenerbahce secure themselves their second Mountain Drake, and with it, they've got some pretty strong items as well. Triple item finished on towards Padam. You've got triple item as well on your mid laner as he puts down the Weaver's Wall to try and shut Team 1 away, and this is exactly what you want to see when you're trying to take an inhibitor, put the wall down, and it opens up so much ground for you. Love the ultimate there from Frozen Zones. The entire lineup of Team 1 away from the objective. That will be the first inhibitor of the game going in favor of Fenerbahce. They also have the double mountain to add insult to injury. Now they've got their eyes on the rest of the map, but the Baron's going to be wearing off, so likelihood is they will back away. Then they start grouping at mid lane. They send Cauldron up to the top, and they may even wait for the next Baron, depending on how safe they want to take it. They will have the Weaver's Wall up as well pretty soon. This is League of Legends by number for Fenerbahce. It's much more patient, much more controlled. It's exactly what we wanted to see. They've been able to maintain a gold lead, a sizable one in 11,000 at this 26 minute mark. And it's never really looked like they'd be get their, they were gonna release their grasp on this game. And it's just unfortunate for Team One because when you look at how their early really game went as well, you'd think their game plan kind of went the way it wanted. Bruce holding his own up against Frozen in the mid lane, Vert, was getting early advantages against Baldrin. They set two ganks up into the top half of the map. Fallout was even able to give him first blood. And now you're saying, oh, okay, we have a, a pretty strong Shen, who once he hits level six has the ultimate, and we can look to make a bot play, but absolute Redbird, they made that fumble early on. They fell behind and they couldn't really do much as a result. And then Crash just kept ganking the top side. So Vert couldn't really use his pressure anywhere else on the map. And I felt like Team 1 came in with a strategy in mind, but when it came to the execution, they just fell short. So coming into Game 2, I still have high hopes, given that right now, things are looking very bleak for them as Fenerbahce look to take their second inhibitor of the game. Once again, 1907, Fenerbahce just closing in on the win. Padden takes a scatter of the week to the base. Here comes the explosive cask as well. The stand united onto Team 1. But Fenerbahce, 1907, are able to survive for the time being. The inhibitor's still alive here for Team 1. If they can get the engage they want, perhaps they can start to come back into this game. It seems like a monumental task, a mammoth task for them. But Team 1 have come from behind many a time before. Vert locked out towards the side. The inhibitor is being pressured by Padden and Japone. A good finding is going to connect. And now we'll see Thordren stepping up to the front. Already Redbird is just dead and Fenerbahce are going to push 
forward further and further. This will be their second inhibitor. They can just go mid, or perhaps they'll even look to push in this next wave. Keep your eyes on the bottom lane too. There's a big minion wave stacking up. There's a flash from Baldrin. And the seismic shove just deleted and demolished. Team one lose a man, and now Fenovace are gonna look for the push. Vert jumps in, but it's just no damage at all from Team One. 1907 Fenovace are looking to clean this up. It will be a clean ace for them as they take down Absolute. They're going for the Nexus Towers, and they're gonna be one nil up against Team One. Very convincing game from 1907 Fenerbahce Esports. 18 to four is the kill score with a 15,000 gold lead to round things out. And if you're a Turkish fan, this is exactly what you want to see. Fenerbahce clean in the early game, clean in the mid game and clean as they take down the Nexus to go one nil ahead. So clean, I can see my reflection in the medic. Very good execution all throughout. Have to bring my eyes once again back to Thordran. This guy, he just seems to be such a big catalyst for the team, whether it be engages, whether it be roams, whether it be just providing utility and protection for his team. He is one of the standout players for me, alongside Patton, who really just did step up during the laning phase, getting those 2v2 kills, bringing that early pressure to the rest of the map and demonstrating that, you know what, we can win laning phase. Yes, we didn't have a great performance during group stages, but we had a tough group, we often picked losing matchups, and now, once you give us the ability to win those matchups with a champion like Kalista, things get a little bit rough for you. And the question is for Team 1, how do they change? How do they adapt coming into that next game? Because they do have strengths. We've seen their pick potential can work, their ability to capitalize on enemies' mistakes. Well, to hear how 1907 Fenerbahce picked up the first win of the series, let's hand it over to Dracos and the analysts. Thank you very much, Medic. A strong initial showing from 1907 Fenerbahce coming in. It was pretty close, it felt like, early on, but they honestly just smashed it from the mid-game. And I think I understand what one eSports is looking for here with the draft. They banned the cog trist. They're saying Patton is only good late game. Let's force him to put the priority on this early game champion. And if, if he plays it, he shouldn't do well on it. And if he doesn't play it, we'll take it in the second rotation. Then we'll have something to beat him even harder in lane. Turns out he's good at playing lane as well. When you give him someone like Kalista, 100% pick ban champion for a reason. And unfortunately mm -hmm. for Team One, whilst you can see merit in the idea, the execution is still something that is going to be a far throw away from what they're capable of doing against Kalista. Yeah, so I want to call you guys out a little bit because we started with uh, we're going to have a rock in the top lane in Thaldrin, mm -hmm. and uh, bot lane is going to be a potential weakness. But when we look at this first roll, that's not really what happened, guys. I'm going to need you to run me through this. Explain what went wrong here. Well, first off, this is just a good gank by Forlan, able to get onto Thaldrin. You saw Vert kicking that one off, looking like a basic trade. Uh, Thaldrin flashes a little early mistake there, but it's tough to say exactly how we should play it. He dies, and at the same time, Padden starts taking this all in down the bot side. They're able to convert on this kill from a point blank binding by Japone. Really good job stepping up and making sure Absolute had nowhere to go. And that's where the Lulu does come into play when you look at the 2v2 fight in particular. It's a good trade from Redbird, good awareness, but ultimately Lulu's getting the kill where Kalista's getting the kill on the flip side. So whilst we saw a lot of resilience from Team 1, still a lot of early aggression, and again, trying to utilize their team composition and their strategies against 1907 Fenerbahce, it didn't really happen in the end because it was still match. And that's really scary because I feel like if you're on the side of Team 1 Esports and you're like, hey, we can attack the bottom lane after this game, you're significantly less confident in that strategy. Yeah, because Patton ends up at 10 minutes plus 12 CSD at 15 minutes plus 25, ends up using that Kalista pick to smash. The one thing that did work out decently well against FB was the fact that they attack the top lane. They kill Thaldrum, which is something we haven't seen a ton of. So maybe if they go for their more aggressive top lane picks, things like that Trundle, Mundo, mm -hmm. Camille, Nar, who knows what, uh, if you start converting these kills topside, it actually gets a much bigger lead than just a Shen kill. Yeah, and that's ultimately the biggest problem that you're looking at is that they have a Shen and they were ganking for the top lane when realistically you bring that champion Sejuani down to the bottom lane to gank for team one. Maybe the kills are more successful. Maybe you do shut the Kalista down and that looks a little bit better for your win conditions as a team, not getting the Shen going against a Maokai. Now, the other thing I want to look at is the mid lane before we go any further in the game, because we talked about Brewster, we talked about Marf, uh, but it didn't feel like a, a, like a bad game, right? It just felt like, but I also didn't feel a ton of impact. It is not like Cinder hard carried. Would we have expected Marth to, to smash lane? What is the actual difference here? For me, it kind of felt like if you look at his play, there were some minor mistakes, missing his Ws, missing his stuns, some combos not going out quite right, but uh, it still feels like Brewster's not as high on the tier list as Marf is, so I'd rather see him a little bit more, but I have a hard time pinning this game specifically on Brewster. 
Yeah, Brisa played adequately, but that's not the kind of adequate that wins you games. You want to see what Marf's doing more, which is leaving lane. And quite simply, that's what Frozen was doing literally everywhere. That guy was all over Summoner's Rift, quick to react, quick to the jump, always there before Brusa. And it's good that you bring that up, because when we take a look at our next replay brought to you by Ace or Predator, you can see what happens when this team is freed up to move around the map. Both yeah. teams transitioning up to the top side. Good wall off there by Frozen, pinning them under the turrets at very low. It's going to make this dive easy because you focus down members when they're low, or if you can't get a good target on somebody, just finish that turret off. Yeah, and the fundamentals, knowing the shot calling from the whole team is you want to kill the turret, make sure that it's not doing damage on top of this, and they're still getting the team fight going at the same time. All of the Morgana blindings were connecting, and far as execution goes, it was still done very cleanly from the side of 1907 Fenerbahce, but ultimately that's what was necessary. The game could have gone the other way if that dive went poorly, and it was a risky choice, but they made the choice and it worked. Yeah, beautiful gold graph there on 1907 Fenerbahce able to just grow that lead slowly over time, close the game out very quickly, sub 30 minutes, and a great start to the series for them. Yeah, now the interesting thing is we just have confirmed that Team 1 have chosen blue. There are going to be no roster changes, so when we're not looking at the mid lane about individual players, that turns us instead to talk about draft, to talk about strategy, and we talked a little bit about playing around the bottom lane as an option, but what is the actual best avenue right now for Team 1 to come back into the series and take a win? For me, I, I just don't think going bot lane uh, the way they did is quite right. Uh, I mean, I, I understand what they're trying to do, leaving up the Kalista, but your bot lane is not like a huge pressure point either. You saw that uh, Absolute had a negative 14 CSD, so it wasn't like, oh, well, he's doing good, and then Patton's doing bad. So you, you went for this weird strategy trying to play around the bot lane, and, and it, it didn't work out. I would rather see more resources invested up in the top side. Yeah, drafting specifically, I wouldn't say the AD carry ban should be the exact same. Things should change there. The big one that I have to look at, though, is towards the middle lane. I honestly just believe that Frozen was able to hard carry in this game with his performance as an individual. And when you look at the comparison between the mid laners, Bruce needs to stop him from roaming around, stop him from being able to get around and make plays. Well, you can get rid of Talia instead of doing all of that in the first place. So perhaps instead of the Tristana ban, just get rid of Talia. Yeah, they got rid of Ori and LeBlanc. I mean, Frozen has a really deep champion pool. It does feel a little weird to throw so many bans at him, uh, but it does feel like, just generally speaking, uh, 1907 Fenerbahce have a lot of different things that they can play across the board, yeah. feels difficult for one to find a way to ban them out. When it comes to strategy in a best of five, when you're the winning team, when you're Fenerbahce, is there really any pressure on you to change anything? Of course, you're now going to be side swap, but outside of that, are you pretty comfortable just taking a similar strategy and playing this game out the same way you did this one? You can use the same strategy, but the risk is that Team 1 have worked out that strategy, and so there's always going to be the opportunity to bring out something different, continue to surprise them, and just best them through the entire best of five by showing the depth of your strategies. Yet, if you're comfortable enough, you're good enough with that one move, you don't think Team 1 can counter it, and you are 1907 Fenerbahce, maybe just staying consistent is the way you play this out. There's not too many things that I would expect them to change. Mid lane champ pool is the biggest one that I feel like changes game the game for the most part it's otherwise a you know tank in the top lane tank in the jungle padding on some kind of late game carry it does feel like a very consistent game plan for them so far at the playing stage of worlds and i don't think there's a good reason to turn away from it given the fact that he just won yeah how crucial is is frozen in the center of all this on the talia on the roaming champions because we saw non-roaming champions band away from orion and leblanc feel very leblanc maybe more so but orion feels very locked into that lane do we want to continue seeing him on champions that can roam like the talia how valuable is that to fenerbahce as a team yeah, now the reason that i feel like Frozen getting Talia is super valuable is because he's a shot caller and a communicator for the team, not just for the whole roster, but for Crash specifically. The fact that you can unlock him, get him to roam around the rift, feels to me like the optimal strategy for 1907 Fenerbahce. You can put him on the Orianna, he'll be able to call the team fights and get the shots going around those fights, but if you get him early and then the whole game starts to snowball with early leads, which is in this matchup what I'd imagine you want to do, well then I feel like Talia is the most important type of style for him to have for Frozen. I mean, even this game, you saw that like Crash came to the mid lane early on, they tried to contest a blue buff, he even died for it, and, and they still did fine. So it does feel like a, a bit of a mismatch there in the mid lane, that something can go wrong, you can give Brewster a kill early on, and it's still something that Frozen can play from a deficit in. Well, we're gonna have to see what they want to do. That was only the first game of the series. Meet us back here for game two of 1907 Fenerbahce versus Team One right after the break.